Okay, yeah, so welcome back uh, to Dharma Night and welcome if you're joining us online. Um, yeah. So last week we launched a series, uh, a new series at Dharma Night, which we've called um, Sangharachita Classics. So some of you might know that um, Bhante Sangharachita, who's the founder of our movement, um, uh, yeah, he was a very, very prolific uh, speaker. Um, not so much a prolific writer. He actually only published um, a couple of books and, and a few sort of like collected works. Um, but many, many of his talks and his seminars have been um, sort of edited into into books and sort of printed um, as um, as these books and. Um, one of the, what we're doing with this series is that each of the teachers at Dharma Night have chosen their favorite um, Dharma talk or Dharma text um, by Bhante. Um, and uh, we're, we're sort of um, giving a little mini talk about it. Um, and when I was asked what I'd like to do, um, I thought maybe I would really like to give a kind of mini commentary on, on being all things to all men. Um, and that's, a, that's one of Bhante's talks in the Vimala Kirti Nirdesha series. I don't know very much about the Vimala Kirti Nirdesha, <laughs> I must say. It's, it's, um, it's part of a, a collection of teachings in the Mahayana, and I would say that probably I don't know very much about the Mahayana, um, but I really, really enjoyed the talks, and I, I think they're some of Bhante's best talks um, ever, um, and I just really want people to listen to it. So this is sort of like an hour-long advert, <laughs> if you like, for Bhante's series of talks um, on the Vimala Kirti Nardesha, and you can find them on Free Buddhist Audio. You can also find them um, in this book, um, Mahayana Myths and Stories, but I would say better just to listen to the audio because um, it's Bhante at his, I don't know, like best and sparkiest. Um, he makes lots and lots of jokes, um, which don't really come across in the text. In the text, it comes across like slightly sarcastic, um, but actually it's really, really funny. Um, yeah, so I just want to encourage all of you, listen to the Inconceivable Emancipation series and the Vimala Kirtina Desha series. Um, yeah. So that's like the main plug, the main takeaway. If you if you have one takeaway from tonight, that's it. Just go and listen to the talks, yeah. And um, of that series, I think it's like maybe eight talks. Um, my favorite one is on being all things to all men. Um, and yeah, so those of you who are sort of know the Bible will realize that actually it's a line from the Bible, um, not a line from a Buddhist text. Um, but yeah, on being all things to all men. And um, I thought where I would start is just to give a little kind of um, background on the Vimala Kirti Nadesha. So how many of you have ever come across the Vimala Kirti Nadesha? No? Okay. So just a handful of people in this room. That's great, because this is like, it's, um, it's a great little story. Um, and um, the Vimala Kirti Nardesha, in a certain sort of way, it's not a Buddhist sutra, yeah? Um, so um, the teachings of the Buddha are collected in, uh, are, are either sort of like suttas, which are sort of more historical, the older part of uh, Buddhism, or sutras, which are kind of um, the latter part of Buddhism. And technically, the Vimala Kirti Nardesha is not a sutra. Um, the Vimala Kirti Nardesha is more like a, a instead rather than a teaching, it's more like a literary work. Um, Nardesha means teaching, so um, sometimes uh, some of the translations are called the holy teaching of Vimala Kirti. Vimala Kirti is the the name of the hero, the name of the bodhisattva um, of the sutta. Um, I thought I also tell you that this text also has an alternative name. It's got several alternatives. Um, and one of the um, alternative names is Achintya Vimoksha. Achintya means something like inconceivable. Uh, and Vimoksha means something like liberation. And I think it's quite a good description for uh, the Vimala Kirti Nadesha because 
um, some of the arguments in the text are really, really abstruse and abstruse, and you can just sort of like skip over them. It won't, um, well, obviously at some point be good to like go back and, and look at them uh, in more detail. Uh, but yeah, I think what it's trying to get to is that um, the experience of liberation is beyond words and concepts. Yeah? So inconceivable liberation, emancipation. So the story opens with the Buddha and he's sitting in Ambapali's park. So we're in the land of myth here rather than the land of history. And Ambapali's park, Ambapali's mango grove, um, is on the outskirts of the city of Vaishali. In the city of Vaishali, there is a bodhisattva, and the bodhisattva's name is Vimalakirti. Now, Vimalakirti is a bodhisattva who manifests as a householder. So I'm just going to pause there and see if anyone knows what a bodhisattva is. What's a bodhisattva? A teacher of sorts. A teacher of sorts, yeah. A bodhisattva is a teacher of sorts. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Peter. Yeah. Uh, just someone that's like on the path to enlightenment. Yeah, so somebody who's on the path to enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. And who supports all other beings to become enlightened. Yes, so support a uh, being on the path of enlightenment supports other beings to towards enlightenment. Yeah, Pete? Is it right that they could go to Nirvana and experience that, but they choose to come back to help people? Yes, so the bodhisattvas make a vow that they will liberate all beings. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. They get reborn in the Saha world until they attain liberation. Go mm. on. Um, who came first, the Buddha or the Oh, that's a really good question. Who came first? Um, traditionally, actually, the Buddha himself is thought uh, is talked of as a bodhisattva. So pre pre sort of um, awakening, the Buddha is often referred to as the bodhisattva, and then post awakening as the Buddha. Yeah, yeah. Did you have a Peter D? It's the same point as Max. Same oh, yeah. question as Max. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, anyone else? Bodhisattvas, what are Bodhisattvas? Yeah? That's my term out of friendship. The one who's done ayahuasca or DMT. <laughs> that is non traditional. <laughs> <laughs> Not offensive, just non traditional. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so um, well, I was thinking that. Well, how I think about it in my own mind is that um, a bodhisattva is one who's um, taken a vow to liberate all beings um, and is on the path uh, towards awakening um, and is quite sort of um, active, is quite active um, in the world. Um, they practice for the benefit of all beings rather for, than um, solely for the benefit of their own liberation. Yeah. So it's kind of got this um, broad outward going um, aspect um, dimension, this altruistic dimension to their practice. So Vimalakirti is very, very interesting because Vimalakirti um, manifests as a householder in the great city of Vaishali. Um, and in this sutta, uh, sorry, in this, in this teaching, in this Nirdesha, um, he manifests as being ill, <laughs> as being unwell so that he can teach um, beings. So um, Vimalakirti is ill and he's visited by kings um, and merchants. Um, and, the, and the Buddha hears of um, Vimalakirti's illness and he's sitting in Amapali's mango grove and says to his great assembly of um, disciples and attendant, other attendant bodhisattvas and he's, says to them, why don't, um, why don't we go? Why doesn't somebody go and inquire after Vimalakirti? Um, why doesn't somebody go and find out how Vimalakirti is? But none of his disciples want to go and visit Vimalakirti. Yeah? So the Buddha starts off by asking Shariputra, 
the visit of Amilakirti. Um, but Shari, Shariputra says something like, um, Lord, I am indeed reluctant to ask the Lichavi Vimalakirti about his illness. Why? I remember one day when I was sitting under a tree and Vimalakirti, and he sort of goes on, he did, relates the story where Vimalakirti encounters Shariputra sitting under a tree um, and just gives him this teaching on how he should actually be meditating. So Shariputra, um, in the tradition, he is one of the Buddha's sort of um, chief disciples. You know, he's, he's, he's like a big meditation guy, <laughs> not, um, not some sort of um, novice uh, meditator at all. And here is Vimalakirti, a householder, teaching the great monk Shariputra how to meditate. Um, and Shariputra says after the teaching, uh, after relating the story of the teaching, he says to the Buddha, Lord, when I heard this teaching, I was unable to reply and I remained silent. Therefore, I am reluctant to ask this good man uh, about his sickness. Yeah. So Shariputra doesn't want to go to meet Vimalakirti and ask him about his health because he's a little bit worried about getting another great long lecture about something. <laughs> So, so the Buddha says, okay. And then he asks his other chief disciple, Mogalyana. Mogalyana, go and inquire after the illness of the Lich V. Vimalakirti. And again, um, Mogalyana says, no thanks. <laughs> and then he talks, uh, he asks another disciple, you know, the sort of like the great and the good of the Pali canon, Mahakashapa, Subhuti, Purna, Aniruddha, Upali, Rahula. He asks all these different disciples and they go, Lord, I am indeed reluctant to go and inquire after the Lichavi Vimalakirti. Um, even Ananda, who is one of the kindest, most compassionate, sort of most outward going of the Buddha's disciples, says, um, when I heard these, these teachings of Vimalakirti, I wondered if I had previously misheard and misunderstood the Buddha, and I was very much ashamed. Lord, such was my conversation with the Lichavi Vimalakirti. I am reluctant to go to that good man and inquire about his illness. So even the most lovely Ananda doesn't want to go and see Vimalakirti. Yeah? Okay. So I just want to pause here and um, sort of interject. I just want to say that we are in the world of the Mahayana, which is, you know, latter Buddhism. So these aren't the sort of um, historical uh, disciples. They're kind of, um, they're kind of like this, this sort of uh, retelling um, of, of the disciples. And the Mahayana does this. It, it sort of sets up um, the early disciples, the Arahants, as um, kind of straw men um, to, to um, comment and argue against religious formalism, um, argue against kind of um, this um, Buddhist triumphalism, I think, um, and the kind of like narrow focus of um, practicing for one's own liberation. But the Vimalakirti um, is quite equal, opp equal opportunities. It also takes a slight big um, sort of aim at the bodhisattvas too, because ha having asked all his um, foremost disciples whether they would go and see Vimalakirti and they say no, the Buddha starts to ask the attendant bodhisattvas. So, um, you know, he, he, he asks Maitreya, Maitreya, would you go and see Vimalakirti? Maitreya says no. He asks <laughs> other bodhisattvas, all the way until finally Manjushri, uh, Manjushri, the bodhisattva of wisdom, um, says, okay, okay, I will go and visit the Lichavi Vimalakirti and inquire after his health. So off Manjushri goes, um, and everyone's kind of relieved that they didn't have to go and sit. So they all decide to follow Manjushri, and this large assembly of Arahants and Bodhisattvas um, walk out of Ambapali's park, walk into the city of Vaishali, um, and they go um, to Vimalakirti's house. Um, and from then on, what you get in the sutra is what Bhante calls a ding-dong dialogue between <laughs> Manjushri and Vimalakirti. Yeah? Um, 
uh, quite a lot of um, different things that happen. Uh, there's more attacks on uh, religious formalism. Shariputra starts to wonder about uh, uh, where is everyone going to sit? Uh, Vimalakirti's house is quite small, um, and there are no chairs. And uh, you get this quite famous line um, where Vimalakirti, the householder bodhisattva, asked Reverend Shariputra, the chief disciple of the Buddha, did you come here for the sake of the Dharma, or did you come here for the sake of chairs? Um, yeah. Um, and then Vimalakirti manifests these 100,000 lion thrones, expands his house, and then all these lion thrones end up in his house, and everyone is seated. Um, at some point, uh, and then there's more dialogue with Manjushri about um, the nature of liberation, and then uh, Shariputra starts to wonder about lunch. Um, it's getting late, you know, monks only eat once a day, and it has to be before 12 o'clock. <laughs> <It's like, laughs> <laughs> and Vimala Kirti, knowing Shariputra's mind, um, manifests, um, like, takes the whole assembly uh, to a different uh, Buddha land, where, um, where the, um, the Buddha teaches by smell. Um, and all beings are nourished um, immediately by smell. Um, there's a goddess that appears at some point, um, and she's so happy about this dialogue between Manjushri and Vimalakirti, has heard so much and gained so much that she calls forth flowers, um, and they fall down from the sky. And they don't stick to the bodhisattvas, but they stick to all the arahants. And Shariputra gets really upset because, you know, as a monk, he shouldn't really be wearing flowers. <laughs> um, and then there's this whole dialogue between Shariputra and the goddess, um, where it's actually quite feminist, you know, for, for such an um, old text. It talks about um, whether or not uh, all beings whatsoever can be liberated, or do you have to be a man? Um, and um, at some point, the goddess turns Shariputra into a woman. He's really embarrassed, um, and then turns him back. And he's really relieved. Yeah, so that's a kind of um, <laughs> that's a kind of um, broad, um, broad, uh, I don't know, summary, I guess, of of the Vimalakirti Nardasha. So um, I really, I really encourage you to read it and particularly listen to Bounty's commentary on it. Um, and then I thought the rest of the evening, I'd talk about one specific um, sort of aspect of Vimalakirti. Um, and how I think of Vimalakirti is that Vimalakirti, I think, is the foremost bodhisattva um, of skillful means, and foremost bodhisattva of skillful means. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, you get you get um, bodhisattvas that represent different aspects of um, the enlightened mind. So you get Tara, who is um, the quintessence of compassion. Um, you get Manjushri, who we've mentioned, who is um, who holds the sword of wisdom. Um, you get Shitigarbha, um, who goes down to the hell realms um, to liberate beings, particularly from the hell realms. Um, and um, yeah, I think of the Malakirti as the foremost in uh, skillful means. So skillful means is uh, a translation of um, upaya kausalya, um, these two words, upaya kausalya. I do think um, it's quite helpful to learn the Sanskrit sometimes because you get all sorts of different translations into English. So it's quite good to be a little bit familiar with the Sanskrit. So, you know, if you meet other Buddhists, you, you kind of like know what they're talking about too. Um, so some, in, in the translation that we, we use most, which is um, Robert Thurman's translation, of the Vimalakirti Nadesha, uh, Thurman translates skillful means upaya kausalya in as skill in liberative technique. Yeah, it's quite technical, <laughs> skill in liberative technique. Um, so, what is skillful means? 
Anyone like to, anyone knows or would like to take a stab at it? Yeah, come on, Pete. Um, I suppose with skillful, it's like being able to not create suffering or not create more suffering. Mm -hmm. um, maybe being able to reduce suffering um, in the, you know, having the means to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so being able to um, reduce suffering. Mm -hmm. Go on, Ruby. Being able to act in a way that's beneficial to others. Yeah, being able to act in a way. And and to yourself, yeah, that's beneficial to others and to yourself, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Nadia, if you look like you want to say something. Yeah, I was going to add, when I think of skillful means, I think of the precepts. Uh-huh. So you've got the five and ten, so um, when I think of acting skillfully, I think of acting out of um, or loving kindness, compassion, um, truthful speech and... Yeah. And generosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So acting skillfully. Yeah. I think upaya, or uh, upaya kausalya, to give it its full, full term, is an interesting, um, it's an interesting concept. Um, basically, it is, it is this thing of um, being all things to all people. You manifest um, in all sorts of <laughs> myriad ways um, so that you help people yeah um, and you don't help them just in mundane ways so of course that's very very important you know if if um, yeah somebody needs a drink of water you give them a drink of water but you also help them in a way that grows them um, that grows beings uh, towards towards um, liberation, towards awakening. Um, yeah. I looked it up on Wikipedia, by the way. <laughs> Wikipedia says, the skill of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in teaching the Dharma according to the needs of sentient beings. Yeah. So according to the needs of sentient beings. So I want to read you a little bit of the Vimalakirti Nardesha because I think it gives you a bit of, um, of a sense of what skillful means might be. So Vimalakirti wore the white clothes of the layman, yet lived impeccably like a religious devotee. He lived at home, but remained aloof from the realm of desire, the realm of pure matter and the immaterial realm. He had a son, a wife and female attendants yet always maintained continence. That's an interesting translation. <laughs> <laughs> he appeared to be surrounded by servants, yet lived in solitude. He appeared to be adorned with ornaments, yet always was endowed with the auspicious signs and marks. He seemed to eat and drink, yet always took nourishment from the taste of meditation. He made his appearance at the fields of sports and casinos, but his aim was always to mature those people who were attached to games and gambling. He visited outsider teachers, yet always kept unswerving loyalty to the Buddha. To develop children, he visited all schools. To demonstrate the evils of desire, he even entered brothels. To establish drunkards in correct mindfulness, he entered all the drinking houses. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is it skillful pleasure seeking? Is it, yeah, well, is it skillful pleasure seeking? Is it? No. No? The first time you wrote that was probably his assistant or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it skillful pleasure seeking? Yeah. If it happens naturally, that's, yeah. just, that's just a bonus. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you have to remember that um, Vimalakirti is a being, um, it's, it's, it's basically an enlightened being. So um, uh, he, 
it isn't as if he is a layman, yeah? Um, he appears um, as a layman. Um, it isn't that... Um, Yeah, it isn't, it isn't like, um, what, what um, the Bodhisattva Malakirti is trying to do um, is to liberate all sentient beings. Um, but where are sentient beings? Yeah, they're not um, probably living in pure Buddha lands. Um, they're living in the world. Um, so to liberate all sentient beings, the Bodhisattva of Malakirti needs to go out um, into the world. Sometimes I think of um, Bhante Sangharachita in this, in this way, that he was very, very encouraging of um, city center uh, centers. <laughs> he really wanted Buddhist centers to be established in cities because that's where people are. But I think um, maybe you sort of hit on something that could be a, a kind of near enemy um, of, of um, skillful means. What would be the near enemy of skillful means? You know, like something that looks like skillful means, but it's not. Kind yeah. do-gooding, perhaps? Could be like do-gooding, yeah, yeah. Yeah, say more. Um. <laughs> well, if you... Um it depends what your intention is. If you're, if you're doing, if you're um, acting for the other person's benefit, and your benefit, and and you're not acting out of a sense of kind of ego and um, I don't know, trying to do good, partly because it gives you a lovely feeling that you mm. might be able to chill off a bit about. <laughs> yeah, okay. So it might look a little bit like do gooding but without the right intention. Go on. It could be like an idea some of that <coughs> um approaching a situation with someone from a kind of preaching yeah. perspective and yeah. you try and almost force the issue yeah. and like and push knowledge onto them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than relating yeah. to them yeah. on a authentic level. Yeah. And allowing them the space to, to find a way themselves. Yeah, yeah. And that's why the visiting of all the different places is so important to, to like gain the nuance to approach each nuanced situation skillfully. Yeah, yeah. So being, yeah, preaching, yeah. And just being able to be kind of appropriate and on point in each yeah. interaction. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. From my understanding, could it also be like almost the opposite of teaching, like provoking people with the intention of trying to teach them something? Yeah. Like, from my understanding, bodhisattvas can sometimes provoke you to a place where you then realise something. And if you're yeah. intending to do that with other people, it could very easily go, go wrong. wrong. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes skillful means is talked about as like, uh, or is used for, for a situation where um, it doesn't look particularly skillful, like say Vimala Kirti going to a brothel, um, but it is, um, but it can also go wrong. Yeah, it can also go wrong. Yeah. Hang on, I just want to go to pee. Oh, I, uh, yeah, I thought maybe like a kind of perfectionism where you think you need to be really advanced before you can help anyone. Yeah. And therefore like, yeah, yeah, that can be that can be a kind of like a little pitfall. I'm not perfect, so I can't help anyone. But actually, sometimes we just need to like help people. <laughs> yeah, go on, V. Yeah, I think it goes back to your point of intention as well, but maybe expecting something in return. Mm. You know? Yeah, yeah, if expecting. That, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, if you get um, yeah, sort of like rather than being completely open-handed, there's a kind of um. You're in exchange mode. Yeah. Um, yeah, just going back to this thing of um, bodhisattvas being, uh, uh, and skillful means being, um, teaching the Dharma according to the needs of sentient beings. Um, 
one thought I had, actually, maybe this is, well, two, I had two thoughts. One was a, a little thing about Bonte himself. Um, when he was alive, uh, he's dead now. He's been dead for about four years or so, died about four years or so ago. But when he was alive, um, he would always be very, very interested in meeting people. Um, and not just his sort of closest disciples, um, he'd meet anyone. So anyone um, could write to him and ask to meet him. And um, one of my teachers really, really encouraged me to do that. Uh, you know, I was sort of barely to start coming along seriously. Um, and I wrote to him and asked to see him. Um, and it was amazing, actually he just talked to me about um, my childhood and stuff that I was interested in. At some point in his life he had visited um, Malaysia where I grew up and then we just talked about tropical fruit for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and when we used to have, well, when we, when he lived um, at Adishtana and we would go up to run these big winter retreats, uh, there'd be like 20 people on the team and he would when he was well enough, meet every single person on the team. Um, and obviously all of us would be like, oh, what did you talk to Vante about? And, um, and it would be a kind of range of topics from like gemstones to um, pets to, you know, he'd just sort of talk to people about their interest. Um, and the thing was that everyone came out of meeting Vante sort of shiny. You know, like when people come back from retreat, they sort of like float a little bit off the ground and they sort of look a bit more beautiful, a little bit more clear. Um, yeah, I just think that's what skillful means might look like. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, in the tradition, uh, skillful means is talked of in three ways. Um, magical formulae, the dharanis, um, the pratisamvit, which are um, analytical knowledges, um, and some grahavastus, which are the means of unification. I'm not going to go through the magical formulae <laughs> or the analytical knowledges. I just want to spend the last 20 minutes of our time together talking a little bit about the Samgraha Vastus and sort of thinking together um, about them. So the Samgraha Vastus um, are the means of unification, um, that which unites the Sangha, um, that which unites a community. Um, and communities in Buddhism are very, very important because um, sanghas are, um, are, are spiritual communities is what helps beings grow. Yeah? Beings grow in spiritual communities, so they're very, very important. So um, the Sangraha Vastus are the four things that unite uh, a spiritual community. So, I wrote them down so that you won't have to hold them in your mind. Yeah. Um, the first, the first um, Samgraha Vastu um, is generosity. So, what, what can we be generous with? How can we be generous? Presence. Presence, yeah, yeah. Presence is really, really important. Um, Fante in his lecture says, a spiritual community is characterized by the constant exchange of presence amongst its members. 10 points for you. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Yanis. Um, showing love to everyone. Yeah. Even, even if you don't let it bother not. Yeah, yeah. Showing love to even your enemy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so generous by um, being loving, um, doing the metta bhavna. Yeah, yeah. Go on, Philippa. With uh, knowledge. Yeah, generous with knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say giving food to the hungry. Yeah, yeah, just in very, very practical ways, just meeting people's basic needs. Yeah, yeah. 
taking your time, like volunteering for the good of the yeah. centre, helping everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Generous with time and energy. Yeah, yeah. Go on, Pete. Uh, well, you can be generous with um, praise. Yes. I was thinking about, like, um, in a work context, yeah. you work on a project with some people. Yeah. And you feel that someone's, let's say, they're new to the company or they're having a bit of a hard time, you can sort of pick them up and say, like, oh, you know, they did really well there. Yeah. It, wasn't, it was more them than me. Yeah. So kind of giving away the praise that, that, that you, you know. Yeah. Letting them take it. Yeah. Yeah, giving people credit, uh, giving people praise. Um, it sounds also like when you do that, you give people confidence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Go on. Yeah, it's kind of an extension of loving kindness, but like un your understanding and like stretching your perspective to accommodate other people's. Yeah, yeah. It's a kind of um, giving of your um, attention and your sort of mind space. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very, very subtle. Great. Yeah. Were you about to say something, V? Um, no, just to back to your point. I, I think the general thing of rejoicing, yeah. and taking the time to think about what you're rejoicing in mm. with someone else, not just sort of go, oh, you know, they always do this, but like actually think and then you can. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, rejoicing done well. Um, uh, we do this quite a lot in our community. Um, sort of identifies um, qualities, um, not of like spiritual qualities really, that um, yeah, that can go into transcendental qualities. Okay, so I guess generosity is something that we um, we talk about quite a lot. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I want to go on to the next one, which is um, priya vadita. So priya means something like loving, um, affectionate, and vadita means speech. Yeah, so loving speech, affectionate speech. So what I thought we could do um, in this in this area um, is have a little discussion in small groups. Um, so maybe like groups of about three. And I thought we could explore what holds us back from being more affectionate and more loving in our speech. Yeah. So what blocks more loving speech? I mean, you might not be blocked, but <laughs> maybe most people are <laughs> a little bit. So um, yeah, do that in groups of three.
interesting come out of that? Anything interesting or surprising? <laughs> yeah. Um, you said quite a lot, but you also said it depends on how the person you're showing love to responds. Yes. So if they acknowledge your love, yeah, it's yeah. easy to continue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You need to like practice with peop people who are easy. But also maybe like um, our loving speech needs to be appropriate as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we kind of came to, I think, as if it's, it's often fear and it kind of comes from maybe the societal expectations that what you're going to say isn't appropriate or yeah. it might not be received in a certain way or yeah. maybe even a fear of rejection if yeah. you do that or some, something like that. Yeah. Vulnerability. Vulnerability, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyone else? Kind of. I think um, you do also actually have to have like a loving awareness of somebody to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like that actually just takes an effort. Um, yeah, you actually have to like love them. <laughs> yeah, but also like I don't know. I think yeah, you have to love them. You have to just like want to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to pay attention to bit more to them. Yeah, that's true. Like, she was told to make a really good point about distractions and when you're distracted by other stuff going on like yeah like dinner or like you know or, or you're scared it's you're like not in the present you're not mindful like in the body let's say yeah and then that's kind of hard to give like true yeah like present compassion yeah yeah kind of elsewhere yeah we get distracted from our ideals and from how we actually want to manifest in the world mm -hmm. um i just want to say that um, that Bande says that it is very, very important um, that we do let people know that we like them um, and that sometimes it actually comes as a bit of a shock to people that um, somebody could even like them. Yeah. So it is very, very important as aspiring uh, bodhisattvas in training that we tell other living beings um, that they are liked. Yeah. Go on, Peter. Just one thought is that like, where, where there's a lot of hatred, I find there's a lot of love as well. Mm. And so, so like, you can get complacent, I think, if you're comfortable and thinking yeah. that art oh, doesn't matter. But in yeah. certain areas, London, where there's, like, a lot of um, gang violence and things like that, you also get a lot of love on the streets. Mm. And I find yeah. that quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so just to sort of finish off about loving speech, um, mm -hmm. 
I'd love to explore that more with you, Pete, but um, <laughs> I better not get too distracted. Mm -hmm. um, just want, I just want to sort of um, make a point that uh, remember, we have, we, with these uh, different Sangraha Vastus, generosity, loving speech, um, and then the last two, which I'll talk about in a moment, I have to remember that these are expressions of transcendental wisdom. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we may not yet have transcendental wisdom in all areas, but we can train. Yeah, we can train. Okay. Um, so, just fairly swiftly, Arthacharya um, means beneficial activity. Yeah, beneficial activity. I feel like we've talked quite a bit um, around, about beneficial activity already. Um, but one thing we might not have mentioned is that part of beneficial activity is um, inspiring people inspiring people um, and being Dharma practitioners in the world. Um, I think, I think this, is, this is um important. Uh, years and years ago, I was sitting in this kind of like uh, Q&A session with order members. I wasn't, I wasn't ordained then, um, but there was this sort of like um, four order members sitting up front and it's like big, big room of people. Um, and it was quite a, um, Quite a sort of heightened time, you know. Um, the, there were these uh, climate protests going on, but also the, the Occupy movement um, was going on. And somebody put up their hand and said, "What is the London Buddhist Centre um, doing about this issue and that issue and that issue?" Um, and the order member who took the question said, "Well, it depends on wh who you mean as the London Buddhist Centre." Um, Everyone who comes to the London Buddhist Center uh, is, you know, part of the London Buddhist Center. Even if you're here for the first time, you've been touched um, by the London Buddhist Center. I hope that doesn't sound too culty. <laughs> 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 um, but basically, you are Dharma practitioners in the world, or you know, at least possibly interested in being a Dharma practitioner practitioner in the world. Okay. Um, Samanatata? I never know how to pronounce this one. Samanatata? Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all that matters. <laughs> uh, it's exemplification. Um, and I tend to think of it as show not tell. Yeah, exemplification. Um, the very important thing about Samanatata is that we need to be consistent, you know. Um, it's very, it can be very um, confusing uh, if you say one thing um, and do another. Um, at the same time, I think maybe Pete was talking about perfection and sort of being a bit afraid of uh, doing things until we're perfect. Um, what we can do is rejoice in our successes but also admit to our faults um, and be open about our, f our failures. Um, we don't need to worry that our practice isn't good enough um, because the vision of Dharma life is one of constant transformation. Um, that's what Dharma life is about. It's about transformation. So we don't need to worry about being perfect from day zero. Yeah. Um, it's um yeah do, transformation uh, is and change and growth um is in itself um inspiring okay so those are the sangraha vastus um and like i said they're the means of unification what these are these are things that build spiritual community. Um, and uh, it appears, they appear in the Mahayana, uh, talking about how do we build a Buddha land. Um, but they also appear um, in early Buddhism. And maybe one day I'd like to come to Taman Light and tell you this, this like story of the um, Sankraha Vastus in early Buddhism. It's great. There's a troll in it. <laughs> um, it's this like great little story about magic um, but I thought I'd just 
conclude the story of the Vimalakirti Nirdesha by telling you a bit about the final chapter. Um, it's, the final chapter is actually very, very short. Uh, it, it concludes with um, Vimalakirti talking about the pure land of the Buddha Akshobhya, the Buddha field of the Buddha Akshobhya. Um, so he, um, he's the Buddha of the Eastern realm. Um, and his Buddha land is called Abhirati. It's called Abhirati. Um, and Abhirati is literally the joyous. Yeah? And I think this is really, really important. The, 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 sutra, uh, the Vimalakirti Nadesha concludes with this evocation of Abhirati, it, the evocation of joy and joyousness. We often talk about um, enlightenment and liberation in terms of more wisdom, uh, more compassion. Um, but you could also say that the goal of the Bodhisattva, um, the vision of the Bodhisattva, is to establish all beings in a Buddha field, um, in the pure land um, of the joyous as well. I was just looking, it was like 9.30. <laughs> it's a big question. It's a big question. Um, maybe what you could do, actually, is to post a link um, to Bhante's series of talks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because he definitely goes through that. All right. So um, that's, that's it for this evening. Um, yeah, I just thought that maybe as a little bit of homework... Um, <laughs> Who comes to Dharma night to get homework? <laughs> um, yeah, as, as a little bit of homework, uh, maybe on your journey home, um, whether it's like walking up the stairs or, you know, getting onto this incredibly hot central line, um, you could just imagine what would it be like to establish um, the people who you meet on the streets, in the tubes, um, in the pure land of the joyous. Yeah? What would it be like? Um, yeah, and you know, it doesn't have to just be tonight. You know, you can sort of like think about this tomorrow, uh, the day after, and the day after as well. Like, what is the meaning of the pure land of Abhirati? Okay. All right, thank you very much for coming, everyone, and um, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.